So right on time, the first keynote is going to be um, presented by John Rees from, from Huawei. Um, I, I read carefully his biography last night, and I was um, impressed and scared, to be honest with you. Um, John Rees has been working for any company that was created in the Silicon Valley in the last 20 years, apparently. Uh, more seriously, he was the CTO of four pretty large companies, uh, the two, la the two uh, bigger ones being Broadcom and Nortel, uh, before uh, joining Huawei. Um, he has 20 years of experience, which means he has seen things being invented, reinvented, and re reinvented. And I think he's in perfect position to, uh, to present his talk about uh, what is old is new again. Um, I know in academia, people tend to believe that what they are working on is always new and, and, and shiny. And it turns out it has been done before by, by, uh, by people uh, in the past. People just forget. So I think it's, it's a very good fit for this conference to, to take some perspective and, and explain that uh, there's nothing really new except things are repackaged, reinvented uh, all the time. Um, but uh, this is, you know, you, it's, not, it's not common to have people that have 20 years of experience in the business. Um, um, so we are very lucky to have John to, uh, uh, to, to present in this conference. Uh, please welcome John Rees from YY. All right. Well, good morning, and uh, again, welcome to Huawei. Uh, my name is John Rose. I'm the uh, Senior Vice President and General Manager of what's known as FutureWay, which is the, uh, the buildings you're sitting in. Uh, we have about 1,000 technical staff working for Huawei, uh, the majority of them in Silicon Valley, acting as the advanced applied technology organization of the, the total company. Uh, you know, I, I actually maybe disagree with Patrick that it is, uh, it is very common in this particular audience to find people with 20 years experience in the industry, maybe 30 or 40 or 50. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, obviously my history is a bit varied. Uh, I, I, I think uh, <clears throat> one of the things about this industry that's exciting is that the industries continuously converge and morph. And so if you find yourself being an expert in uh, silicon development for switching platforms, uh, you might find yourself in a future life uh, working on high performance interconnect in a server or in a storage environment. It is, uh, and interesting enough, the skills that you develop to solve a data networking problem may in fact become the problem space uh, that an entirely adjacent industry or maybe even non-adjacent industry is trying to resolve. And so the, 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 when I was asked to do this, I kind of thought, what do I talk to in, for this audience? Uh, obviously, it's a very specialized audience. And uh, the first thing I decided not to do is to talk about uh, uh, specifics of what you're going to talk about for the rest of the conference. Uh, I think that's, uh, that'll be covered in depth. I thought that the most useful thing to do would be to give you a bit of our, our our point of view about what is going on at the, the higher levels of the industry, what is going on at the technology levels of, those industry, of the industry, and, and most importantly to remind you about something that I think we, we often forget, and that is that the technology industry tends to repeat itself quite often. Um, before we start, just a, a quick show of hands. Who has been in the industry as a practicing engineer or a technologist for five years or more? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? 50 years. Okay. Okay. So, so I, I measure my time in the industry based on the number of recessions we've gone through, the number of bubbles that have burst, uh, and the number of times that we tried to solve the exact same problem using entirely different people uh, without any context of how we failed the last time. And I think we all can acknowledge that that, that, that continuously is happening. And interestingly enough, right now, there is a, a fairly large amount of activity going on in the industry where there are some very new and interesting buzzwords that are quite exciting. But any of us that have been in the industry for a long time know we've been here before. And it doesn't mean that those new buzzwords are bad. It just means that it is incumbent on us to remember how we might have dealt with problems in the past and lessons that we learned as we went through that evolution. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we see what that future looks like. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about some of the observations I've had about, uh, uh, let's call it my preference for mistakes, that it would be nice if we didn't repeat this time. Um, anyway, 
So I, I, I feel obliged to do a bit of a commercial for Huawei because unfortunately Huawei is the, in many cases the largest company people have never heard of. Uh, it, it is a very, very large company. It's the first of the very large globalized technology companies to come out of China. Uh, from a revenue perspective, last year we did $32 billion in sales. This year we'll do about 38. Uh, we are growing very fast even through the down market. Uh, as of the first half of this year, if you look at uh, carrier equipment spending and buying patterns, Huawei was the largest, the number one provider of carrier equipment uh, in the transmission side, if you will, uh, in the industry, eclipsing Ericsson by a little bit. From a demographic perspective, it's a very large company. Uh, as I mentioned, we have about 1,000 technical staff here in uh, between Silicon Valley and a couple other centers across North America. Uh, but the overall size of the company is much bigger than that. There are 140,000 employees in the company. There are 65,000 in R&D alone. It's an enormous R&D engine. Uh, the, uh, the footprint is pretty much globally dispersed. We have engineering centers all around the world. Obviously, the, the biggest clusters are in China, uh, but the company is highly globalized. Yeah, kind of makes that point. Um, interestingly enough, the company, while it started as a telecommunications equipment supplier, has diversified. And over the last year, one of my jobs, in addition to running Futureway, was to help Huawei enter the enterprise market. Uh, it was a classic Huawei. We decided that we wanted to be bigger. Uh, we figured that there was an adjacent market called enterprise. And so we set a target to get to $15 billion in enterprise by 2015, move 20,000 people into the organization, and said, go. And the result of that last year was about a billion five six in collected revenue and about almost $4 billion in contract revenue and bookings in our first year of existence. So it's a, a very large player that has a, an awful lot of activity in the industry these days, but very limited presence or visibility in places like the US. If you travel internationally, you'll see a lot more of us. Uh, in fact, I think around uh, a third of the planet's population in terms of telecommunications sit on Huawei networks in one flavor or another, wireless, wireline, or access. So enough of the commercial, now that you know who we are. Um, I'm going to start high level and then go down. Uh, one of the things that I find is rarely talked about at conferences like this, and uh, I've spent enough time, and I'm a IEEE 802.1 guy for reference. Uh, I spent a great deal of time in the 1990s when VLANs were being created, if any of you were involved in that. If you remember uh, people like Tony Jeffries and Mick Siemens and others, I was a part of that cluster, if you will. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one of the things that we tend to forget about is that there's an end customer, and the end customer changes in terms of what they think about. Uh, ten years ago, if you talked to a CIO or an IT director, they were very interested in the performance of your device, the capacity of your network, the price of the device. They were technologists in many cases. And what's interesting is over the last 10 years, that has fundamentally changed. And in the last two years, it has changed dramatically, where the CIOs are almost uh, ambivalent towards the technology. They want to talk about it, but it's not really part of their remit. They are thinking about things that are much more business level or much more abstract. Now, why does that matter? Because if we build interesting technology in terms of the technical execution, and we are not aware of what the sensitivities are of the ultimate end customer that will buy this technology, we may in fact miss the adjacency or miss the intersection and end up with a, a great technology that nobody really cares about. So one of the things that uh, we see as happening is that the CIO uh, is, is clearly in a bit of a vice. On one side, they're being told to slow down on innovation. Uh, if you've talked to a CIO, I have lots of CIO friends out there, they, uh, they tell me that in their budget, they have uh, about 50% of their budget being spent to support what they already have, about 49% to support the regulation and compliance obligations that they have, and about 1% left over to do the one interesting project a year, <clears throat> which we should understand, because if you build a fantastic technology that implies that they're going to have to spend 10% of their budget to implement the new SDN architecture or the new uh, data center architecture, it is unlikely they even have the budget to do that. The second side that they're being pressured by is clearly the CIO is one of the least popular people <clears throat> in, uh, in an enterprise. Uh, I, I actually think that uh, 10 years ago it was a good job to have. Today you are 
the person getting in the way of what the end user and the employees want to do. And what they want to do is they want to innovate more. They want to bring their own device. They want to use any device they can think of. They want to use any application. They want social networking. And those are perfectly valid objectives, but fundamentally, the CIO has to balance that between that first set of parameters. And then lastly, the CIO is being shifted to think about not just technology and balancing these two sides of the vice, but there also is an expectation that they are going to help the company move forward. And there is an expectation from the board and from the CEOs that fundamentally technology will allow a company to differentiate itself. And so they are asked to think about what that future enterprise environment or that future carrier environment is supposed to look like and what the big problems they're supposed to address are going to be. Now what's interesting is that the big problems that they're addressing today have almost nothing to do with technology when the CIOs and the IT groups think about them. They are, there is technology underneath, but the problems are much, much larger in terms of the scope. The typical problems they're facing and the things that they're trying to challenge are how do you build the distributed enterprise? Meaning, what happens when your enterprise scale is no longer measured based on supporting the number of users based on employee count, but has to actually scale to the number of customers? Now, think about that for a second. If you build a data center architecture and it's perfectly optimized to support all of the employees of Huawei, that's great. But if you actually have to build that data center architecture to support everyone who interacts with Huawei on a global basis, given the fact that we, spent, we sell six to eight billion dollars a year of cell phones and tablets that sometimes touch our infrastructure, it's an entirely different scaling factor. The federated enterprise. We clearly know that enterprises no longer exist within the four walls of their data center. There is an expectation today that any data, any function, will traverse the enterprise boundary. Some of them may not, but it could. Global supply chains are set up in this way. Customer interaction is set up in this way. The idea of federation is an expectation from the customers. Now, how many of you in your career have tried to solve federation problems in standards work? If you were involved in things like bandwidth brokering, uh, if you were involved in diameter, for instance, there was a huge amount of work to solve this problem technically but it never really was solved because we couldn't solve the political issue. We couldn't solve cross-billing. We couldn't solve charging issues. The, it wasn't the technology function that failed. It was that we didn't really understand the political layer of trying to federate enterprises. But the CIOs don't care. They ultimately expect that if, for instance, in their IT infrastructure, there is an expectation that their global supply chain will interact with their internal R&D organization, and it should just happen between their data centers and across their networks, that it is the obligation of the supplier and the vendor to solve that problem. Tough problems. The intuitive enterprise. I am a big believer on HMI and UX. I think it's uh, woefully lacking in this industry. I, I, you know, if you look at almost any company in this industry, their investment in user experience is a rounding error compared to their investment in everything else. And it's because it's not considered engineering. <laughs> Now, anybody in the HMI world will argue about that, and they're correct. It, it is engineering. It's a different kind of engineering. But the bottom line is most companies, uh, I'll give you the numbers. At Nortel, I had 12,000 technical staff working for me. When I walked in, I had a group of probably five people focused on HMI. And they were focused on picking which color of beige the, car, the box should be. It wasn't about what the user experience ought to be. And so we built an HMI group. I've done that now at several companies to quite frankly think about the fact that if your technology is not intuitive to the end user, and the end user could be the IT staff or it could be the actual end user, ultimately it will always be viewed as a cumbersome, difficult technology, and it will never really meet the expectations of the customer. I got myself into a little bit of trouble a couple of years ago, actually uh, two years ago. I spoke at the Canadian Telecom Summit. Now, that's for context. And I put up a chart talking about the need to focus on HMI, and I was in Toronto, Canada, and my example was an iPhone versus a BlackBerry and asking which one won. <laughs> okay? You all know the answer. And it won not because one is a better radio or a better memory system or a better compute architecture. The one that won was the better user experience. And clearly, the customers are trying to figure out, how do I build IT systems that are no longer as clunky as, uh, uh, not to pick on companies, but classic SAP implementations, classic enterprise implementations of any software, to be perfectly honest, versus what is being seen in the consumer space today in terms of user experience.
Again, what does that mean to the physical layer? Well, I don't know exactly, but if you think about ways in which you may be able to optimize or enhance the user experience or make something that used to be a manual event transparent, make something automated and disappear from the user experience in a way that makes the overall experience better, you're moving in the right direction in terms of the customer expectations. The extended enterprise, we sometimes call that cloud, but the bottom line is uh, realistically, Every enterprise today has made a conscious decision that many of their services will be external to their environment. Whether they're co-located, or whether they're hosted, or whether they're a managed service, fundamentally that is happening. The mobile enterprise. I am a big believer in mobility. I believe that uh, within five years, you will have a tough time identifying who in your enterprise does not need to be mobile. Today, you think about who needs to be mobile. Who needs mobile support? Who needs a mobile client? But clearly what is happening is a massive shift towards the end user becoming a mobile entity. And the end user might not be a person, it may be a machine. And the reality is that belief is not just my belief. Most enterprise environments are absolutely considering the fact that their enterprise intrinsically already is highly mobile. And lastly, the virtual enterprise and the virtualization of the enterprise is a clear problem that our customers are facing. Uh, you know, the, only, the main reason for this is cost. You cannot afford to have dedicated services and systems for every application and every purpose in every scenario in an enterprise today, given the budget issues that we talked about at the beginning. Okay? So again, high level stuff. A little bit below that, if you ask what's driving this change in the enterprise thinking, why they're thinking about these big problems, it's because there are three fundamental shifts in terms of technology expectations that are occurring. The first is what we describe as the consumerization of IT. This idea that the, whether it be enterprise or carrier, or even the consumer world, technology from one domain is entering other domains without our permission. If you, let me give you a good example in terms of this audience. I'm sure that most of you are not using mobile devices that were developed by an enterprise company. <laughs> you are using devices that come from Samsung or Apple or consumer companies but you are using them within an enterprise context. There was not a conscious decision to do that. It happened because better technology existed outside and it became part of the enterprise experience without the permission, in many cases, of the IT organization. We are seeing that the expectations in terms of how software is developed, how systems operate, where you work, are being driven by the expectations that are set on the consumer side. I did a keynote at Interop uh, last year and talked a lot about the fact that the enterprise has become slow and maybe stodgy, while the consumer world has just been this rapid acceleration of innovation. And if you as a human being live in both domains, and one of them is exciting and one of them is boring, you inadvertently transpose the experience and the technology from the exciting one into the boring environment, with or without the permission of the IT organization. My advice to CIOs these days, however, is don't resist this. It's a good thing. Consumer technology is just technology. If it solves an enterprise problem, then embrace it, learn about it, adopt it, implement it in your environment, become an expert in it. The second is the mobilization of IT. Clearly, we are seeing a shift towards mobile users. Uh, the best data point for this is, I don't know if any of you are in the switching world. I'm sure some of you are. If you look at the number of switch ports per office or per cube over the last 10 years, <laughs> It has decreased dramatically. I remember when we used to put eight or 10 switch ports live in a cube. Okay? We don't do that anymore. You're lucky if you have two. <laughs> Maybe only one, because your IP phone acts as a relay, and that's where you plug your PC into. The reason for that is not because we don't like switch ports. It's because the devices that we're using intrinsically want to be on a mobile network and don't need that wireline infrastructure at the access side anymore. We have clearly seen that most of the enterprise activity and the business activity is now being done off-premise. It's being done over mobile networks, over cellular infrastructure, over Wi-Fi environments, and that does not necessarily limit the opportunity for wireline, and wireline still is the aggregator and the core and the data center, but clearly there is this shift towards mobility. And then lastly is this concept at a technical level of the distribution of IT. This idea that IT systems are no longer highly centralized. In fact, things like storage are being distributed into the cloud, into data, data centers, into distributed architectures. The compute architectures are becoming distributed if you're in the carrier side. If you look at something like a radio access network today, 
in LTE, what you see is a massive distribution of functionality across the RAN. It is different functionality, though. The RAN became simpler, and then we accommodated for that by putting caching and storage and hyperlocal advertising engines and shunting mechanisms out into that RAN that used to exist only in the centralized core. Distribution is a reality. It's happening at all layers of the infrastructure, whether it's enterprise carrier or consumer. Fundamentally, these are changes in the way that we think about the technology footprint that we're using to solve enterprise carrier or consumer problems. The last point on this section is just to make that the reason for all of this is actually not so much around technology, but based on a fundamental change in the industry organization. We like to use the term ICT to describe that change. ICT is just information and communication technology. And it's a boring term. It's probably the wrong term to use. But basically what it says is, I'll make a prediction for you. In five, maybe 10 years, there will no longer be a carrier, enterprise, and consumer industry with respect to technology. They won't exist independently. There will just be technology that is used for ICT purposes. There will be great terminals, and there will be great networks, and there will be great storage, and great applications. And some of them will be applied in different ways. But the fundamental underlying technology will flow very freely to solve enterprise problems, consumer problems, or carrier problems. If you don't believe me on this, there are lots of proof points today in your hands that describe that ICT has already happened. A little bit of a quiz. How many of you are using an iPhone, an Android device, or an iPad? Anybody? No, I hope so. I should say who isn't, then we can embarrass them. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you're using that, are you using it on a mobile broadband network for a cellular provider? All right. Yeah, absolutely. And are you using that device over that mobile broadband network to do not just consumer stuff, but actual work? Right. Yeah. You're doing corporate email. You might even be running some enterprise applications on it. Now, the reason I ask that question is, let's think about that for a second. Which ecosystem created the device? It's consumer. Which ecosystem or industry created the network? It was clearly the carrier world. And which ecosystem or industry created the applications? It's your enterprise environment. Now, the funny thing about it is you put those three things together, and you created a function it's actually quite valuable. Who in this room will give back that capability? If I told you you can't have it anymore, would you volunteer to hand it back? Maybe you would if you want some peace and quiet. But the bottom line is it's so valuable because of the convergence of these technologies that you couldn't imagine doing your job or existing in a real environment without it. And so the reason I bring that up is that's a great example of early ICT convergence, this idea that to solve the complex problems in the future, we fundamentally are not going to be able to solve them with just purely enterprise technology, or purely carrier technology, or purely consumer technology. We are going to solve it by extracting technology from each of those toolkits, and combining them in interesting ways. And the result will be fantastic experiences that become absolutely critical to our existence. There are many other examples around that in telematics, in e-medicine, that are already emerging. Now, if that is what the definition of a solution is going forward, then underneath what is ultimately starting to happen is the technology ecosystems are changing. Companies are redefining themselves. Huawei wants to be an ICT company. We have a $6 billion consumer company. We have a $4 billion enterprise company. We have a $22 billion carrier company. But our vision is to have a $100 billion ICT company <laughs> where we use a common set of tools to solve problems for that broad set of potential customers. Clearly, companies like HP, companies like IBM, Microsoft think of themselves more and more as ICT companies. And that's challenging for us, because I think most of us, if I asked what project you're working on, what technology you're building, it would probably map to carrier, enterprise, or consumer as the ecosystem and the domain in which you're targeting your technology. And if what I said is, just, is true, that those won't exist anymore, <laughs> is your technology applicable? to a broader ecosystem in which they all converge. Just food for thought. OK, so shifting gears again, coming down another level, let's talk a little bit about what we think is actually going on in the industry. And I'll do this more as a kind of question and my answer to the question, because I think there's some interesting questions that we need to answer. And, uh, as a standard disclaimer, these are my opinions. These are not necessarily the opinions of my employer. Uh, they are probably not your opinions. Uh, free to debate them. but. Uh, in any event, uh, they're hopefully at least interesting. So the first uh, 
politically incorrect statement I will make is that the future topology of most environments is moving towards a model in which it will be dominated by consolidated virtualized data centers of various flavors and mobile clients. And almost everything else, while it might be necessary, will not be the priority. Okay? Doesn't mean that networks are going to go away or aggregation networks are going to go away. They play a role. But the shift towards mobility at the edge and the shift towards virtualized, consolidated data center architectures is clearly happening. And if you're on either end of those spectrum and you're not doing one of those two things, not moving your access environment towards mobility or not moving your compute storage and I.O. environment in the data center towards virtualized distributed data centers, then you're probably not going to be in the right place in three to five years. Okay? So if you believe that, then there are a number of things that are going on in the industry that are interesting questions to ask and answer. The first is, if we believe that virtualized consolidated data centers are going to exist, where will they live? Where will they be placed? And the answer, I hate the term, but the answer is they will live in clouds. But the problem is, you know, clouds are kind of a silly term. I'll give you a funny story. In 2006, Bill Gates came up to Ottawa, I was CTO in Nortel, and he did a speech. And he talked about, you know, what Microsoft's view of the world was. It was very interesting. And he talked about all the stuff Microsoft was doing. And then he used this kind of derogatory term called cloud to describe all the stuff in between the Microsoft products. And it was lowercase cloud. This doesn't matter. This is just dumb stuff that's in the way between the two Microsoft products. Very interesting, you know, kind of interesting observation from Microsoft in 2006, how they were thinking. Three years later, companies like Amazon and Google and others essentially co-opted that term. <laughs> they changed it, they redefined it, and they described it as not lowercase cloud, but uppercase cloud, if you will. That it was now not the internet, it was this idea of some utility oriented virtualized infrastructure. I think their definition was too narrow because it was just the data center. I actually believe it's the virtualized internet, not just the virtualized data center. But we saw a massive shift towards rethinking about what that stuff in the middle was and how that utility model would work. Now what's interesting is if we think about clouds today, we have, uh, I was speaking on the Econ or Guardian magazine or Guardian newspaper and I, I, they asked where we were in cloud evolution and I said we're at version 0.1. <laughs> And the reason being is that the only thing that we've really built today are virtualized compute and virtualized storage inside of the virtualized data center. But if you actually ask yourself what could be virtualized in this new utility model, it's much bigger than that. My expectation is that the cloud data centers of the future, the cloud compute architectures of the future, will not just be generalized x86 virtualized for generalized compute processing. They will be highly specialized. It will make a lot of sense to have virtualized transcoding farms, virtualized crypto farms, virtualized analytics farms that underneath them have very specific hardware architectures. The commonality around virtualization that we want to make them utility-like, we want to make them fluid is consistent. But the function underneath it will not just be x86, it will not just be generic storage. It will be a broad range of functionality that is necessary to solve a broad range of problems. And those problems will not just be to run an SAP instance or to run a website on that virtualized engine. In the carrier world, it will be the consolidation of the carrier infrastructure. It will be cloud RAN, if you're familiar with that concept. Cloud radio access network architectures basically say, for us to move to small cells or two-tier topologies, we have to rip a whole bunch of functionality out of the small cell. We cannot afford the cost of a macrocellular base station at the second tier. So how do we solve this problem? We minimize the functionality at the edge, and we aggregate the functionality that is extracted from it into a virtualized, highly efficient core function. And it doesn't just include you know, non-real-time software functions. Some of the baseband functionality is potentially going to move into virtualized infrastructure within the RAN and within the center of the infrastructure. And it will be done using the same concepts that we talk about today around virtualizing a generic application in the enterprise. Okay. The third piece in this, however, is that there will be devices and entities that exist between the legacy and the future. One of the things that we realized is that enterprises, for instance, are very uncomfortable with public cloud environments because they have a thing called a legacy. <laughs> the two major issues are security and the ability to have portability across clouds. 
And that's what I hear consistently. Security will solve. I'm, I'm a big believer that we have a, 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 an inherent capability to solve security problems eventually, as long as we don't expect perfection. Portability is a different discussion. And so we actually have a belief that there is a whole new set of functions in these cloud architectures that is necessary that acts as the abstraction layer between public virtualized services and private environments. The term we use for that is something called a cloud gateway. Uh, you could call that a product or a function or a place in the infrastructure. But what it says is, you know, convincing an enterprise to move their applications into Amazon Web Services is very difficult to do. Not only do they have to rewrite their applications, but they also have an entirely different management paradigm, a different set of user accounts, a different set of policies. There need to be devices or entities that sit between these domains that act as transcoding mechanisms, transposition mechanisms, policy transformation mechanisms. Now, we have many examples in other domains where we've done exactly that, but in the cloud world, it apparently seems to be the current thinking that you will either have an enterprise infrastructure that you will virtualize and call that a private cloud, you will have a public cloud, or you will have a hybrid cloud, which really is kind of a funny term because it doesn't actually mean anything today, in which you'll use both. What you really need is a true hybrid cloud in which the public services do not look different than your enterprise expectations. The phrase I use is we have to figure out ways not to turn enterprises into clouds, but to turn public clouds into enterprises. We need to figure out ways to project onto them enterprise policy, enterprise security models, enterprise control. If we do that, the enterprise CIO will adopt it. How do you do that? Well, there's cryptographic problems, there's policy problems, there's control problems, there's jurisdictional problems, there's location-based data problems, but they're all very solvable. But they will not be solved within the cloud, and they will not be solved within the enterprise, typically. They will be solved at the demarcation between these two domains. And whether that's physical or logical demarcation, don't really care, but it's necessary. What will the data center network be? Obviously a hot topic in this discussion. Today, the data center network is you know, homogeneous, relatively flat, uh, capacity-oriented, 1 in 10 gig in terms of the capacities in many cases. The security model is edge, and there's a little bit of virtualization. You know, I'm sure many of you have more advanced data centers today, but by and large, this is the state of the enterprise data center network. What's going on, though, is fantastic, because there's a huge amount of new technology and expectation occurring, but it's going to create challenges. Obviously, virtualization will increase. We have a very, very strong estimate that you know, within the data center, we should be at terabit interconnect within the next four years. There's no reason why we can't get there. Will it be standardized? I don't know. I mean, IEEE moves a little slower than we'd like in some cases, but the bottom line is we will clearly see boxes that can move terabit over a link. Uh, in WDM, if you aggregate lambdas, you can do that today. It's not that difficult. The LAN on motherboard environment is going to move to 40 and 100 gig, probably to 100 gig. 40 seems a little esoteric, even though it's, uh, as the former Nortel guy, I understand that. Um, yeah. The challenge there is, how many of you were involved in storage when we moved to 10 gig server interconnect? Anybody? Do you remember what happened to the uh, IP stack? We started to run into problems with selective retransmission, that they didn't have enough buffer capacity. You drop a fragment of a storage block, storage blocks are much bigger than TCP windows, and it started to cause all kinds of problems. I remember being at IETF meetings where people were debating using uh, TCP flags to try to indicate delimiters for these higher level payloads. It caused all kinds of unexpected problems. I will guess that when we move to 100 gig or higher capacity, we're going to break a bunch of protocols again. <laughs> We're going to change the buffer expectations because we don't understand exactly what those structures are. The reason being is that in the storage world, while storage blocks, block storage was well understood, we have a whole new class of storage called object storage in which the size of an object can be enormous. And we don't really know what will happen if an object is being passed over a TCP session and we lose pieces of that object and the thing at the other end has to deal with it at an object level. Does it have enough buffer capacity to store, uh, I don't know, a terabyte of capacity while it's waiting for one block to show up? I don't know, but, but we should think about it. There are clearly new topology models materializing, service provider bridging, Trill, OpenFlow. These are just topology models. I don't want to belittle them, but they're, they're just different ways to do topology. I mean, we'll have lots of debate about that. Uh, they're, they're good things, but they're <laughs> new. Uh, as a guy that, uh, for full disclosure, I was the CTO of Cabletron Systems. If any of you remember Cabletron Systems, in 1992, we built a technology called Secure Fast Virtual Networking, which was a controller called a virtual network server 
that managed a connection-oriented Ethernet flow-based environment, okay, 1992. We ultimately deployed about 100 million ports of that stuff over the 1990s. Learned an awful lot of very interesting lessons about what happens when you go flow-based and you try to do it with a controller. Uh, you learn that you have to distribute certain functions. You learn that there are many interesting corner cases. You learn that applications don't behave the same way in some of these paradigms. Doesn't mean they're bad technologies. It just means you're going to have to learn a whole bunch of new skills and deal with a bunch of corner cases to resolve issues as you deploy a new topology model in an infrastructure that wasn't expecting it. New programming models are going to materialize. Uh, obviously, RESTful APIs out of the network are necessary. SDN, in my mind, is many things, but one of the more interesting ones are the northbound APIs. This idea of having a programming model out of the infrastructure. Ethernet transport ma will materialize, et cetera. The bottom line is the impact of this is that we're going to see an increase in power consumption and cost in the data center. We're going to shift. So if you're in an industry right now that is in the data center business, data center networking business, congratulations, you're probably going to have a good business model. You're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> data centers are going to become larger. Data center networks are going to become more interesting. Uh, if you're in a network industry or a company that only sells access networks on the wireline side, that may be a bit of a problem. Uh, the bottom line is there are many things that we're going to have to resolve. For instance, and I don't know if you're talking about it at this session, but SDN rationalization and interworking are going to have to be dealt with. We do not have consensus about how SDNs will be implemented and much less how they will interwork with each other. There are many different virtual switching architectures that are in, proposed today. We acknowledge that there will be virtual and physical switches. How do they work together? What functions live on either side? How do we get the optimal collaboration between those two technologies? Second question, how and where will data be stored? Our answer, again, maybe politically incorrect, is hybrid storage. But hybrid storage means something a little different in my world. Uh, clearly, we know that SAN and NAS have a third player now, cloud storage architectures. Cloud storage architectures typically rip out most of the hardware. They use consumer-grade disks, a software layer to do configuration control. They are typically, uh, in many cases, DHT-based in terms of how they deal with data store and, and data recovery in it. They don't use RAID. They use erasure codes and other technologies that are emerging. Uh, but the big debate right now is in the middle there, and that is, is cloud storage another tier or does it ultimately become the platform in which SAN and NAS become virtualized on? Now, we all know today that it's very hard to do block storage over a cloud storage architecture. But that's a technical problem that is solvable. And if the economics, we have a project right now called Sea of Disks. It's at CERN. We're commercializing it later this year. And the economics are roughly an order of magnitude better than typical SAN and NAS storage in terms of cost per unit of storage. Performance is quite good, scales to hundreds of petabytes. <laughs> it's a big system. And if I have that big system, and I can use it today as just another storage architecture, primarily for object store, can I improve it to ultimately make it the basis for the entire enterprise storage architecture and change the topology of SAN and NAS to actually make them virtual services on top of this common storage infrastructure? I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but it is very possible. If you look inside of Google or Amazon or any of the companies that are doing heavy cloud storage architectures, they are not necessarily acknowledging that SAN and NAS and traditional storage architectures are necessary. Today, they're doing it by rewriting the applications, but I think there are techniques in which we can actually morph the cloud storage architecture to make it compatible with the applications that require block storage and file storage type environments. Okay? What will compute look like? Well, again, politically incorrect, but I think important. It will be diverse and virtualized. I had a long discussion with uh, some of the researchers down at, in San Diego about this because I'm a little surprised that we're not spending enough time on virtualizing everything in the compute architecture. There's great architectures around virtualizing x86. We're now talking about virtualizing ARM and doing some work in that space. But if we think about cloud architectures going back to the beginning, in which the cloud infrastructure might not just be the place where we run general applications, but it might be a place where we run baseband functions that used to exist in a base station, the things we may need to virtualize might go all the way down to things like DSP, or crypto accelerators, or transcoding accelerators, or media processing accelerators. If you think about the server architectures in the future and what will be virtualized at the virtual machine level, it probably will be highly diverse. It will not just be a generic one-size-fits-all compute model. It will be a broad set of specialized compute technology that is shared as pools of resources at a virtualization level 
that support a wide range of applications, some of which are highly optimized to take advantage of very specialized hardware that now becomes a utility pool as opposed to a one-to-one -one mapping. Additionally, we're clearly seeing this shift towards rack scale. We've been doing the analysis, and quite frankly, one of the biggest problems in data centers today is power and cooling. And most of it is tied to the fact that we want a bunch of rack-mountable servers that are all independent nodes because it's cheap. But the problem is, to solve power and cooling problems, it's much easier if you actually scale to the rack, or maybe even scale to the, the row, and aggregate the cooling across the row, aggregate the power across the row. We've seen it now with memory, with certain types of solid state memory and memory aggregation. It's very likely that we'll see more of that as we go forward. Who's going to use this infrastructure? Back to my original premise, clearly mobile clients. Uh, and what we mean by this is that uh, there is a fundamental shift if you look at enterprise usage patterns and consumer usage patterns towards mobility and the devices being intrinsically mobile. In fact, we have seen many environments in which there are no fixed devices anymore. I would challenge you, uh, two years from now, in your home network, do you honestly believe you will connect anything over an Ethernet cable? Right? I just don't think it'll happen. Your television is already over Wi-Fi. Your Xbox is over Wi-Fi, if you have one of those. <laughs> your tablets are over Wi-Fi. Your laptops are over Wi-Fi. Your desktops are even over Wi-Fi today. Most state-of-the-art desktops today come with a .11n or AC interface on it. If we look into the enterprise, what we're finding is more and more there are no devices at the access level that are being connected directly to the physical infrastructure. And when we look at the other environments that are materializing, they're following the same pattern. Okay? What does this mean? Well, it means that we're going to have some interesting changes in our expectations. First, there's going to be a massive diversity in terms of those devices. We cannot assume a homogeneous Windows environment at the other end. The second is there's some good news here, and that is wireless acts as an interesting resistor <laughs> in terms of the, uh, at the analog level. Wireless networks are intrinsically less bandwidth capable than wireline. There are things like Shannon's law. There are limitations on wireless capacity. And that's actually good for us because it forces us to no longer have to deal with infinite bandwidth consumption on an individual node basis as we move to wireless. The problem with it is that now because we have scarce bandwidth again, potentially scarce bandwidth, we have to be much more intelligent about how we use that bandwidth. And so guess what? We're back into an era of quality of service and class of service and prioritization, which many of us have been through many, many times. Uh, usually, we try to solve the problem, and then we give up on the problem because there is a bandwidth step on Ethernet. Uh, and I've been there too many times. You know, in-serve and diff-serve are great discussions. And they're still good technologies, diff-serve at least. And it all kind of faded away when the capacity of the network went up a level. People started to say, well, we'll just throw bandwidth at it again. And we now have 100 gig, and we're just throwing bandwidth at a lot of core problems and not trying to solve them intelligently. But on the access side, what I can assure you is that Shannon's law is very real. We will continue to see improvements in spectral efficiency and coding. We will see more capacity. It's very likely that within five years, we will have what we call multi-radio concurrency, which basically says we will have a 700 megahertz channel at 10 megahertz that basically is the always-on channel. And at 5 gigahertz, we might have a 100 megahertz band that's available for terabit capacity or gigabit capacity across the infrastructure. And they'll be running at the same time on the same device, one short range, one long range. But the bottom line is even those will be tiny compared to the capacity of the wireline environment. Okay? Who else is going to use this infrastructure? Well, one of the more interesting ones, and Hamid Amadi did some great work here around machine to machine and Internet of Things, is that we are clearly seeing a diversity in the types of devices. You know, at Nortel, I talked a lot about something called hyperconnectivity. You know, it was politically incorrect at the time because people were describing the trend in 2006 of convergence, if you remember that. And maybe some of you were actually advocating this. We are going to converge to one device and it will do everything for us. And that seemed pretty silly to me because it seemed very obvious that no one device could do everything. And in fact, you actually wanted lots of devices working on your behalf. And the principle of hyperconnectivity said the number of connected nodes would far exceed the number of connected users. At the time, in 2006, cellular penetration rate in the US was about 70%. Today, it's over 100%. In places like Italy at the time, it was 120%, but it's now much bigger. 
And it is very likely that we will see 10, 20, 50, 100 to 1 ratios between human beings and connected devices. So the problem with this is when you have a connected device, it doesn't have a human attached. Actually, that's an advantage and a problem. The uh, variability is a little less because there's no human there. But the problem is it's dumb. And what it means is that the device cannot be the place where security is fully implemented, where policies are fully implemented, where management is implemented, where troubleshooting is implemented. And so we have to figure out where do we put that technology? Do we put it in the data center? Do we aggregate or pre-aggregate? The work that Hamid worked on was basically saying that machine-to-machine -machine and Internet of Things should start with a two-tier model, that you minimize the sensor, you minimize the node that is actually doing the function on the network, but you pre-aggregate local to it, and you implement virtual services in the domain, in the house, in the business, in the car. And then you present that as an aggregate service back into the cloud or back into the internet. That's one approach. <laughs> there are going to be other approaches. But imagine the environment where we're talking about 50 billion or 100 billion or a trillion nodes in the internet. You know, Dave Clark had a great quote in, I think, The Economist magazine. I was talking to him in, in 2007. And he talked about the trillion node internet. And people thought that was kind of silly. But it's perfectly realistic if you actually look at the number of compute nodes sent, sold annually. And you ask how many of those compute nodes, the CPUs, are actually network connected? Tiny fraction of them. We all know that the value of a compute node is improved dramatically when it becomes connected to a network. Okay? And it is very likely that there will be a consistent trend towards connecting compute nodes, whatever they are, sensors, control systems, to networks. And that will have a huge implication on how we build our network infrastructure. Some of the things to consider. The most important one is that session count is going to increase. One of the things that scares me about the current SDN dialogue and many of the topology models is that they are flow-based, where they are thinking about sessions, where they are thinking about communication between two nodes as an explicit entity. That's great if there aren't a lot of sessions. I've been through this before. But if we have massive session explosion without aggregation, we have an enormous state problem that we're going to face. And it's very realistic to think that if for every human being there are hundreds of devices that at a minimum, just for AAA functions, have to home back to a data center and have a session to make sure they're authorized to do their function, that the session count of any network is going to expand dramatically as we move into this Internet of Things environment. It has huge implications on hardware design. It has huge implications on how the systems will operate, hashing algorithms. Uh, I mean, we all know the problems when you start having a scaling issue around these things. More importantly, in the Internet of Things, we have a very diverse set of bandwidth expectations from the nodes. And the example I always give is there is a huge difference between a video sensor and an HVAC system. Both of them sit on a network. Both of them are essentially sensors. One of them is periodically sending keep alives and occasionally getting control signals. It uses kilobits per second of bandwidth. And the other one, Huawei has some deployments in China that have a half a million video cameras, surveillance cameras deployed in a city. All high definition, 60 frame per second, <laughs> and sending massive, massive amounts of capacity into that infrastructure. So uh, all sensors are created equally. All of them will drive session count. Some of them will drive sessions that consume huge amounts of bandwidth and are real time. Some of them will be huge amount of bandwidth and non-real time. Some of them are very low bandwidth, but very high efficiency and very high predictability. Other ones are best effort. That diversity will cause us to rethink our switching architectures, our network architectures. And if we're not careful about what the consumption model is, many of the topology models we develop might not actually work when this occurs. And the last point on this is that our security model is going to have to change. Today, I, you know, I'm, I believe that we do good enough security, um, but security is never perfect. Uh, there's obviously uh, limitations in every security model. But as we move into this future, we have many things that are going to change. The first is that security becomes virtualized again. In a next generation virtualized data center, two things are going to occur. One, the security functions are more than likely going to become, in many cases, just like compute functions, virtualized functions within the overall virtualized infrastructure. But the implication on that, on the network, is pretty profound. It requires us to develop technologies that allow us to do things such as service pathing, where if we don't have an explicit place where the firewall is, <laughs> or the IDS function, or the security function that we want to inject into the service flow, we have to have a network that's intelligent enough to actually make sure the traffic gets to that virtualized service, 
passes through it in a timely manner, <laughs> or a sequence of these functions, and ultimately reaches its destination. And when there is a change in that topology, that we don't run into a situation where the convergence time reestablishes a session but forgets to reroute through the service nodes that are providing security, which could very likely happen. The second problem we're going to have is that as we move everything into the aggregated data center, there's this interesting problem that the demarcation point between the aggregated data center and the rest of the world is a security boundary. And what that means is that our security systems no longer can be lower bandwidth than our networking infrastructure. And so one of the biggest areas of security these days, at least within Huawei, is cloud scale security. How do I have terabit capacity in my unified threat prevention or threat protection systems? Very hard to do. Security is a much more complex function than just moving bits around. <laughs> but if we don't have that mapping, then we have an interesting bottleneck that we inject into the system. So to wrap up, just uh, hopefully this gives you some picture about what we're thinking about. But I want to ask a question. Does this all remind you of anything? Does it remind you of an environment where we had centralized data processing and storage? We've seen this before. Okay? Uh, an environment where clients became thinner, or maybe were very thin. Uh, does it remind you of an environment where the network's role was minimized? Nobody talked about the network. It seemed to disappear. It wasn't important anymore. Uh, it should, <laughs> and it should because there are not just one, but there are multiple instances where we have actually been right here before in building what we just described, making these changes. Now, we did it in different ways, but the general goals of cloud and SDN and virtualized services and mobile clients, many of the principles that we're thinking about right now, we have dealt with before. And it's not that we failed. In fact, we were successful. I'm, full disclosure, I'm a token ring SNA guy from a long time ago. I thought SNA was a great architecture. I've done NCP gens. I've built SNA networks. I even know what APPN is and how to deploy an APPN network. Um, but the bottom line is we've been here before, whether it was in the SNA world, in the mainframe world, uh, not, no slight to DEC because theirs was similar also, uh, thin clients, you know, if you go back into the Citrix and Microsoft early implementations and even today, Huawei's entire R&D environment is virtualized in the sense that we use uh, server-side uh, guest OS for everything that we do in R&D. Everybody is on a thin client. 65,000 people doing R&D are, are operating entirely in data centers over thin clients for security reasons primarily. Web portals were another example of this, where we said, let's shift the function where it just lives inside of Yahoo or Amazon or, or AOL, and the network is just there to move the bits around, and the client is just a web browser. We have been here before. This is not the first time for this. And if we have been here before, there are certain lessons that we probably ought to remember, and I would hope we will not make the same mistakes. So I will give you my five. Hopefully, you will all be thinking about your own, because I think all of you are old enough to remember having been here before. The first is that the network is important. If we forget that the network is important, if we suddenly think that all the action is what's going on in compute and storage and applications and higher level things and that the network doesn't matter, we will fail. And the reason we will fail is that without network capacity, abundant, cost-effective network capacity, there is no cloud. There is no virtualization. These things don't exist anymore. And their expectation is that that bandwidth will not only be what it is today, but it will grow exponentially over the next forever. Back of the envelope math I did a couple of years ago, looking at 20-year period from about 1980 to about 2000, was that we improved bandwidth efficiency in terms of cost per bit by 22 million to one. Yeah, pretty good, congratulations. We get no credit for it, but the bottom line is if you compare the cost of a 300 baud modem in the SNA world to a 10 gig NIC, it's 22 million to one roughly. That was a great improvement. And we will continue to do that, but unfortunately today in some of the dialogue, we're not paying as much attention to that. <laughs> as an industry, we think that the action's elsewhere. But if this collapses, everything falls apart. The second. Again, you may agree or disagree on this, but my belief is that when we start to have to expedite traffic over the network, class of service, priority, simple is better. When we get too sophisticated in our quality of experience, quality of service mechanisms, they generally never tend to get adopted. You know, and, I, and again, just my opinion, there was InServe and there was DiffServe. I'm a DiffServe fan. DiffServe's easy. You mark it, you send it, you can, you can aggregate. InServe makes a lot of sense for certain functions, doesn't scale. <laughs> 
Let's not repeat that mistake in SDN. Let's not repeat that mistake in cloud. Let's learn that every time we solve the QoS issue, we solve it with a simple, elegant solution that scales and aggregates, not one that is overly complex in its engineering and design, even if it's a good technology. The third, scale kills and aggregation solves. When you start to have systems where a primitive scales, and the primitives that concern me right now are session count, flow count, the diversity of the nodes, these things are dangerous because it's very obvious to me that they're all going to grow exponentially. And if we build systems that throughout the entire system have to be aware of the state and behavior of these sub-aggregates, we will run into scaling problems. We've seen this before. Anybody who's ever built a router knows the reason MPLS exists is because of this. If you were involved in ATM, you understand what didn't work there. And let's be very careful as we go into this next generation of technology that we realize that the formula has always been. We would like to have the precision of a flow, but we need to have the aggregation of an internet. And that is not done with one technology. It's done by consciously understanding that closer to the edge, you can be very precise. But as you move into the core, there have got to be aggregation technologies that allow you to scale this environment. Otherwise, that precision will kill you. Okay? Fourth, no matter how much you want a predictable static structure, it never happens, as long as there are human beings involved. This makes me nervous in the data center discussion today, because we believe that we can create orchestration services. We can bring the network into, an, into a consolidated virtualized data center. We can put it under one orchestration tool. We can have the orchestration tool program the network servers and storage and the VMs associated with it and make a predictable behavior happen. It's great. It does work, except what happens when things change that the orchestration tool is unaware of? What happens when the orchestration tool cannot keep up with the change? Power goes out. You have to reset the entire system. Massive topology shifts occur. Failure conditions occur. People get involved. Somebody doing something as simple as removing a board in an aggregation router could cause a cascading disruption throughout the entire system. The conclusion there is that when we develop our architectures, we should try to make them appear static and appear predictable, but at the lower levels recognize that they need to be self-organizing, self-optimizing. They need to have a level of autonomy closer to the infrastructure so that they do not fall apart when the unintended or unexpected things happen at the lower levels. Because the higher level systems simply do not have the time, compute capacity, or awareness to deal with those. Makes me nervous right now because I hear a lot of dialogue around shifting all of the intelligence upstream. I think we should do some of that. And I think some of it makes a tremendous amount of sense. But at the same time, if the network itself is not reasonably autonomous, recoverable, intelligent, we run into this problem. And the reason we run into it is not because the defined scenario happens. It's because the corner case happens. The unpredictable happens. And I assure you, as long as there are human beings or software engineers involved in it, we will have unpredictable behavior. Okay? You know what I mean by that, if anybody's ever written software. If anybody write bug-free software, come talk to me. I don't know anybody who does that. And then lastly, kind of a minor one, but I think important, especially in a networking context. Don't assume bandwidth symmetry. And the reason I want to point this out is we have made some huge mistakes as an industry thinking that we understood how people would consume network bandwidth. The best example I give all the time is Slingbox. So how many of you are familiar with uh, DSL? You know, Huawei's the, one of the largest providers of DSL in the world. DSL is an interesting technology. It works pretty well. But it has, a, in general, a, in most DSL variants, an asymmetric bandwidth pattern. Wireless has an asymmetric bandwidth pattern in many cases. It assumes that more traffic will go to you than from you. And then one day, somebody ships something called Slingbox. And people start transcoding video feeds and injecting them back into the network. And it caused huge problems in the bandwidth planning and the scaling of the network and the operation of the network that were not really expected. We are clearly seeing that. We saw that with YouTube. We see that with, uh, with user-generated content. We will see that in machine-to-machine -machine and Internet of Things. And so again, I've watched this happen over and over again, where we assume that there is a particular use case, and we try to optimize our bandwidth in a way that is highly structured and does not assume 
agility in terms of the symmetry of the communication streams. Okay? And that has implications on how we do buffering, how we do our backplane I.O., how we do the actual switching architectures. Imagine if you had a pool of flows that you have to allocate inside of a piece of switching silicon, and you decide that for some reason they're going to be asymmetric in terms of how they're placed on a port level. You're going to partition them. What assumptions are you using to make that decision? You're doing it because of efficiency reasons, but my comment here is assume that whatever assumptions you made to make that decision will change. And the only guidance I can give you is make sure that it's incredibly flexible. <laughs> because, quite frankly, in the cellular world, we figured that out. In LTE, for instance, channels are now flexible. You can actually decide to deploy LTE with different channel widths. And that allows us to say, if for some reason the upstream channel <laughs> needs more capacity, we can reallocate bandwidth in both TDD and FTD to try to figure out how to use it more optimally if the world changes, which we couldn't do in older generations of cellular. So we learned that lesson. We need to make sure that we don't forget it in the other areas of the topology. So I'll end there, but end with a little quote. I, I, I like uh, Werner Heisenberg because uh, Joachim Heisenberg, his son, was the chair of the physics department at the university I went to. Um, but I thought this was a good quote. And it says, an expert is someone who knows some of the worst mistakes that can be made in his subject and how to avoid them. And so the purpose of the discussion today was twofold. One, to kind of give you a bit of a, a high level view of what we think is going on. So you understand the expectations at the CIO, the expectations at the IT level, the changes that are happening and the assumptions that people are making around everything from data center architecture to network architecture to end user, but also to get you thinking about one very important thing and that is that we need to make sure that as we build this next generation of network, which we built three or four times before, solving the same problem in, in a new and novel way, that we consider the fact that we have been here before and that there were problems in the past that, quite frankly, made our life very complex and difficult. And had we just paused and realized the mistakes we made in SNA, we might have done better in thin client. And if we understood thin client better, we might have done web portals better. And hopefully, if we understand how all of those worked and what those mistakes were and what the gotchas were, that when we think about this next generation, which is inevitable, of cloud-based, distributed IT, highly mobilized infrastructure, internet of things, that we will not repeat these mistakes again. So hopefully if we accomplish some of that, then that's good. But welcome. Thank you for coming to Huawei. Uh, we're glad to host this. And thanks for your time today. Thanks.